Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and the decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions are those of the speaker. Hello, and welcome to SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Kyle Hammerness, on behalf of the Faculty Division of the Federalist Society. We are here today to discuss Bissonette versus LaPage Bakeries, Park Street, LLC, in which the Supreme Court issued a 9-0 decision on April 12, 2024. It is my honor to introduce our guest today, Professor Samuel Estreicher. Professor Estreicher is the Dwight D. Opperman Professor of Law and the Director of the Center of Labor at New York University School of Law. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to our guest to discuss the overview of the case and the court's decision. Hi, thank you, Kyle. Um, I had written an amicus brief, and this case is called Bissonnette versus LePage Bakery Workers. The case has to do with an exception to the Federal Arbitration Act, which was a 1920 statute, federal statute that requires that all arbitration agreements are enforceable as written in a very important law uh, in advancing employment arbitration and other arbitration of other kinds of disputes as well. Many states have similar statutes. Uh, this, the federal statute has an exception in it of four, I'll just read you the language, contracts of employment of seamen, railroad employees, or any other class of workers engaged in foreign or interstate commerce. So the question in Bissonnette was, this, the, the, the plaintiffs in this case were drivers for, for LePage Bakeries. LePage Bakeries is one of the biggest baked goods uh, manufacturers and deliverers in the country. Uh, and uh, these folks drove those trucks, uh, bringing the baked goods to particular retail outlets in Connecticut. Uh, they also had some quasi-salesman functions. This is something very common uh, in the baked goods area where uh, the deliverer also has to sort of make sure that the product is properly displayed, that it's displayed at, at a level where the, the customer sees it, and also introduces new product sales. This is very common. Uh, I know this from my experience uh, representing uh, uh, Frito Lay, which they do, in which they do the same thing. So the question was whether these workers are covered by the exception. They're obviously engaged in transportation tasks. Uh, it's not clear, it's not clear that a majority of their tasks. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the assumption is, for purposes of the decision, which by the way was nine zero, which is not that, it, which is not that common in the Supreme Court, but it was a nine zero decision for the drivers, for the drivers against LePage bakeries. The question is, is this an industry-based exception uh, or is it just in individual workers? If it's an industry-based exception, then we'd like to know what industry uh, these drivers were working in. And it would seem, it seemed to me anyway, writing the amicus brief, that they were engaged in a retail bakery business or wholesale bakery business, but they were not engaged in a transportation industry. They were doing incidental tasks. They were important tasks, but tasks for the bakery, uh, but they themselves were not in a transportation industry. And our argument in our brief was that Congress actually meant a kind of industry-based exception because they were trying to exempt from the Federal Arbitration Act workers in industries that were already regulated by, by the federal government and had already provided for a dispute resolution mechanism. So that was the basic theory of our amicus brief, that if you look at, at the language, but you look at it in the light of the purpose, the purpose was to exempt industries that were already regulated by Congress and had already provided for dispute resolution machinery, which might conflict with the basic model of a court-based Federal Arbitration Act. That was our theory. We thought there was some support for it. We knew there was some support for it in Circuit City, which was a case I was also involved in. And so that was the theory of the amicus brief. Um, the Supreme Court 
uh, basically rely, in part relying on a textual analysis in which they say that the focus of the exemption that I've read to you is a worker-based exemption. I'm not sure the textual analysis goes quite as far as the court says, because it says contracts of employment of seamen and railroad employees or any other class of workers engaged in foreign or interstate commerce. And I thought Houston Generous, uh, the, uh, the ex examples would control the residual class. But that's not what the court holds. The court holds, and so they're basing it on a so-called textual analysis, but it's not clear uh, that the text really carries the court as far as it, th it thought. But they're also basing it on a, on a decision previously decided by the Supreme Court, which involved uh, ramp agents for Southwest Airlines. Airlines. This case is called Saxon, S-A-X-O-N versus Southwest Airlines. And the question in that case was whether or not the ramp agents were engaged uh, in a transportation industry. The Supreme Court rejected the argument of Southwest Airlines that it was an industry-based analysis. In other words, that we couldn't say that everyone that works for Southwest Airlines is a transportation worker. We have to look at the actual tasks of the particular worker. So, Sax and Saxon had language that the focus is on what the worker does, not on what the employer does. That was the language. And arguably, that language was fairly broad and could have been narrowed to decide the case, but that's the language. And it was also a unanimous decision. The chief judge did not participate for other reasons. It was 8 0. So we have an 8 0 decision of the Supreme Court that has language that says it's an industry based. It's not an industry-based exemption. It is a worker-based exemption. So what the Supreme Court did, going back to Bissonnette versus LePage Bakeries, 9-0, relying in part on a, uh, on a textual analysis and in part on the language that was used uh, in Saxon, which I think was broader than necessary to decide the case in Saxon. In any event, that's where we are. The court said that there were certain open questions that it was not decided. So I'll read them to you. Uh, one question was whether these people were transportation workers. Well, uh, they were transportation workers in the sense most of their task would have to do with would have to do a, a time a time analysis uh, of their time. And maybe this is truly an open question, looking at whether or not uh, the majority of their time was spent in these various sales functions, sales promotion functions, or was the majority of their time spent in, in transportation. And that would be something on remand. Um, the court uh, repeated language from Saxon that the workers have to be actively engaged in interstate commerce. They have to have a direct and necessary role in interstate commerce. You know, I don't like to make short-term predictions, but uh, I'm not sure this is going to be much of a, an avenue for uh, LePage, but I'm sure they're going to try to pursue it. Another question is really interesting is the left open whether these workers were engaged in foreign or interstate, sorry, whether these drivers were engaged in foreign or interstate commerce because they delivered only in Connecticut. Now, this is really interesting because I think some members of the court would like to go back to a narrower version of the Commerce Clause in Article 1, Section 8. And there are other cases that have been filed with the Supreme Court raising the same issue. I happen to be a nationalist. I know that I'm on a FedSoc program, but I'm a nationalist. And I uh, I wrote an enormous paper in high school on Frankfurter and the Commerce Clause. So I'd, I'd hate to see us going back to a, a view of the Commerce Clause that said, until it gets into interstate commerce, uh, it's not within the power of Congress to regulate. Uh, <clears throat> these people may have sold only in Connecticut, but their ingredients, I'm sure, came from other places in the country. So that needs to be uh, examined as well. So those are two uh, open questions. Let me offer you a third one that is not mentioned by the Supreme Court. Many states have, and some localities have similar statutes to the Federal Arbitration Statute in which they say that uh, you know these contracts are enforceable as written or there'll be different language, but the basic idea is that arbitration agreements are enforceable because the old common law, 
The old common law was that arbitration agreements were not enforceable until they were reduced to a to an award that you could sort of opt out of arbitration at any point until they were reduced to an award. And the Federal Arbitration Act was intended to override that common law position, as were these state laws. So the question is, could could a bakery like LePage say, well, maybe they're not enforceable under the Federal Arbitration Act because they fall within this transportation worker exception, but maybe they're enforceable under a state law. Now, we'd have to look at, 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 at the text of the state law. Uh, and a state law could not, in fact, override federal statutory provision. So to the extent that the page wants the benefit of an implicit jury trial waiver, whenever you have arbitration, that may not apply in, if you're only relying on a state statute. This is an open question, by the way. It's an open question. I'm just pointing it out it's a third open question uh, uh, that uh, will have to be resolved down the road. Anything else I can give you, sir? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, could you go a little bit more, um, it, uh, maybe explain a little bit more how the the court came to a, so, so basically the exception is that this is a worker who has some functions in an industry or has some functions that in another industry are covered, right, by this federal statute am i am i getting that the correct? Supreme Court's holding get nine zip is that it's an industry-based exception sorry it's a worker-based exception it looks so, to the, the so yeah, so could you could you explain um the the difference and how and how you would read an industry-based exception versus a worker-based exception now after this this case uh, i don't think uh it's going to work under the federal arbitration act so the question is is congress going to pass another statute very unlikely the plaintiff bar and their friends and allies in Congress hate arbitration, even though it's good for most workers. That's been my view because they get a hearing. So I don't think we're going to see new legislation for quite some time. So that's why I brought up the two open questions that the court mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and the application of state and local law. Okay. So it's possible some states would take an industry based view of their statutes. It's their statutes we're talking about, the state statutes, state laws. So that's a possibility. And the other two possibilities are these folks, even though they were involved in transportation tasks, they spent them, you know, the predominant part of their time in the sales function. You know, based on my uh, experience many, many years ago, I'd say 30 years ago with Frito Lay, I don't think it's likely. I, I think it's likely most of their time is spent delivering goods. But that's a factual question that has to be resolved. The other question I mentioned to you is really interesting. Are they engaged in interstate commerce when they sell only in Connecticut? So that is something I'm sure LePage Bakery is going to focus on. I say okay. there are other states that are doing this as well. And maybe you, we could have a SCOTUS interview on that. There's a recent decision striking down the Corporate Transparency Act. In part, this is an act that requires everyone that is planning in corporation to file information with the United States government. And one of the arguments is that when you have started a corporation, but you haven't done anything yet, you're not in interstate commerce. So that's an important case, CTA, the Corporate Transparency Act, which I advise you to have a SCOTUS um, interview on. And the best person there would be my good friend, um, <clears throat> Thomas Lee from Fordham University, because he argued this. He won in a district court. Let me assure you, this is on appeal, and there's going to be a lot of contention around it, because it's the same issue I just highlighted for you. Is it within the power of Congress under the Interstate Commerce Clause to regulate activities before they actually enter into the stream of interstate commerce? Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers. Founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental power is essential to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series 
including SCOTUS Cast and Practice Group Podcasts on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 